Well, few topics are more vexing, complicated, or emotional in the food space than GMO. You've heard that referred to uh, GMO, genetically modified organisms. You've heard that referred to a couple times, several times this morning. In talking about innovation to feed the planet, we felt we not only should not avoid this topic, but that we should embrace it and take it on head on. Some see promise, some see peril. For sure, it presents us with a moral dilemma. So we decided to set up a GMO debate. Moderating the debate is someone eminently qualified <clears throat> to organize the discussion and to focus on facts. And that's what this is all about. And what I'm going to ask you to do, just to focus on facts and to listen. Respectfully, please. Corby Cummers is a senior editor, food writer, and generally an important person at The Atlantic. He has been <clears throat> called the dean among food writers in America. He's a winner of the James Beard Journalism Awards. Julia Child, no less, said <clears throat> he really does his homework. Got that, folks? His books include The Joy of Coffee and The Pleasures of Slow Food, and he's here to moderate our GMO debate. Ladies and gentlemen, Corby Kummer and the panel. Please, go ahead. Okay. So we have far more distinguished people than I. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and we're all very excited to be here. We have Amy Harmon, multiple Pulitzer Prize winner from the New York Times. We have Margaret Mellon from the Union of Concerned Scientists. We have Phil Miller in charge of regulatory affairs for Monsanto, and Greg Jaffe in charge of biotech at Center for Science and the Public Interest. And I'm really excited to be here today on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, to talk on a topic that no one really knows what they feel about, right? None of you has an opinion on GMOs. It's one of those, everyone's so wishy-washy, so we're going to help you make up your mind today. Um, what we really hope you'll do is keep an open mind. No matter what you've come in thinking, I have no idea if you'll change your mind. None of us has any ideas, but I hope we're going to be getting some new information that can help us understand the nuance and uh, take a more informed position because that's what feeding the planet can do and that's what we're all gathered here to do. And no one better to lead with than Amy Harmon. Uh, a longtime science reporter and Pulitzer Prize winner. Everybody always gets that in once it's uh, forever attached to the name once it starts. Uh, whose pieces uh, in the New York Times this year you have all read. Uh, in July, A Race to Save the Orange by Altering Its DNA, and then Golden Rice, A Lifesaver. They were very eye-opening, even for those of us who've been following these topics for a long time, because through the use of narrative, Amy made riveting a bunch of moral dilemmas and made us all, I think, think differently about GMOs and the food supply and what it means for both the people who grow them as well as the people who eat them. Amy, I was going to ask you what led you to this and how you changed your mind or, or opened your mind while you were researching it. So, well, it's my, my job at the Times is, is to sort of illuminate the intersection of science and society. So this, so genetically modified crops is like the perfect, I mean it falls squarely in that intersection. It's a science that is, that sounds a little bit scary, that the risks and benefits are not fully understood, and it affects our everyday lives. So it's sort of like a prime topic for, for me. Um, but I started poking around about it, and you know, it's also my job at the Times to write something new. <laughs> and so this debate over GMOs has been going on for 20 years. So like a year ago, when I started thinking about it, I thought, like, is there anything new to say here? And um, I, you know, it, GMOs had sort of clearly become linked in um, the public mind to industrial agriculture, big agriculture. You know, people did not like GMOs because they associated them with, you know, chemicals. They associated them with Monsanto, no offense. <laughs> they don't like Monsanto. Well, that's the beginning of many <laughs> Monsanto, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, you know, but, and I, I might not have written about, and the other part of my job is to tell a story. So I might not have written about GMOs had I not stumbled across the story of the orange, the plight of the orange. And I, but I did, and I thought it was really, I thought that it, I hoped that it would shed sort of a new light on, on the subject of GMOs in general. And, um, and that is because, well, so how many people drink orange juice? Do people here drink orange juice? 
I actually prefer grapefruit juice, but, um, but grapefruit juice is also threatened. So I, I learned about this disease that was threatening the orange industry in Florida, the crop in Florida that basically provides most of the orange juice that Americans drink. We drink a billion gallons of orange juice a year. Um, and it's, it's really in jeopardy because there is a bacterial disease uh, that originally came from China and is spread by an insect called the Asian citrus psyllid and it is wiping out the crop in Florida. It's called citrus greening. And they've tried everything to, to cure this disease. They've, you know, they tried, they, they are spraying lots of pesticides to try to um, stop the insects that spread the disease from tree to tree. Um, they tried biological controls and they've looked for naturally um, a mutant tree that would resist the, disease, resist the bacteria, but they can't find one. And so they have turned to trying to find a genetically modified solution. So, that, so the orange itself does not have the ability to fend off this disease, but some organism that exists might. And if they took a gene, the leading one is a spinach gene, um, that is able to fight off this bacteria and put it in the orange and, and grew an orange tree, it might be resistant to the disease. Let's and just stop yeah. and say, spinach, it's green. It's <laughs> not a fruit. It's a vegetable. And they experimented with fish. So we're already getting into the territory that people start worrying about in transgenic mutations. Yeah, so there, right. So there's this, this element. So in addition to like a dislike of big agriculture and, and big companies, uh, there is this sense of like, oh, that's like just kind of, it's like the, the ick factor. Um, but I, so I asked these, these people, uh, it's a, an orange grower who's um, spearheading this particular effort. There are other efforts to do this. Um, and I followed them around for a while and talked to their scientists and tried to understand what they were doing. And I really just tried to sort of lay out that case because to me it seemed like a different kind of GMO. Like not all GMOs are created equal. And when we think about GMOs, we think about, you know, we think about chemicals or we think about big and we, but it's just a technology. You know, it's not, it's not a food system. And I, I felt like they, these, each crop should be weighed on its own merits. And so, um, and we think about fish in our flavor saver tomatoes or, <laughs> yes, or things yeah. like that. That is what comes to mind. So that's, Right. Why so, this right. People changed. would ask them, you know, will my, will my orange juice be green? And the scientists would have to explain, no. You know, it's the gene that gets put into, the, the, it's the function of the gene that matters. It is not, uh, you know, one gene does not carry with it the identity of an entire species. Um, you know, will, will my orange juice taste like spinach? No, it won't. It won't. So, um, so uh, you know, that was that was the first story, and I, um, and. Uh, that, that was published in July, and, and it, it got a lot of reaction. Um, and some of it was, you know, some of it was good. But <laughs> before the reaction, some of the issues that came up in the story were the very economic survival of not only the farmer, who's a very large-scale farmer, you mentioned were, but also a whole state's industry. Right. There are 70,000 jobs uh, that are related to the orange, orange growing in Florida. Um, again, we drink a billion gallons of it a year, so if we didn't have something to protect Florida's trees, we would probably Im be importing them, although it's, this is a disease that's affecting orange trees around the world, so eventually that might not even be uh, an option. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, you know, so it's a question of sort of costs and benefits. Um, what are the risks and, and what are the benefits? And so, and so maybe, and then, so that, that story was published and it had sort of, there was a whole flurry of reaction and I was kind of dealing with all the reaction over my um, summer vacation in July. And then, and I, I thought that that was kind of over and then I came back and, and I wrote about another one because there was a little news thing that I learned about actually on Twitter that um, where golden rice, which is another genetically modified crop that's been um, in development for a really long time. How many of you have heard of golden rice or followed it? It is very widely known yeah, and followed. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, did, I learned about it in the course of reporting on this orange story, but I didn't sort of, didn't have room for it in the orange story. So I was interested to write about that too. And, and um, what had happened in early August, uh, um, some protesters in the Philippines where the rice is being, is in field trials and they hope to introduce it um, uh, sometime soon. Um, was ripped out. So, so protesters like ripped down a fence and ripped up the, um, the rice plants that were growing in this field um, where they were being tested for uh, um, uh, the effects on the environment. 
Um, and I, I just sort of use that as a, as a peg, a news peg, to write about you know, this issue of golden rice. Because you, know, you could sort of say, well, OK, maybe I don't care about orange juice. Like maybe, I don't, maybe I think orange juice actually is unhealthy, and I, you know, I, I prefer. Or Florida's too centralized in agricultural <laughs> yeah. industry. Yeah. It would be it's better for return to smallholders. <laughs> right. right, right. So you could do with that orange juice. But, but what golden rice is aimed at is, um, is saving people's lives. Um, and and uh, about half a million children go blind because of vitamin <laughs> A deficiency in uh, developing countries, and, and vitamin A deficiency weakens the immune system, so uh, many more millions die because of a weakened immune system because for, of other diseases that they wouldn't otherwise die of because they, don't, they lack vitamin A. And what golden rice does is it uses a gene from corn and a gene from a bacteria, and it creates um, beta carotene in rice. Rice is eaten by, you know, many people in the developing world only eat rice, um, and so uh, it's a way of getting beta carotene to these people who, who eat rice. Um, and so the protesters in the Philippines had a lot of the same concerns as, as activists here who oppose GMOs in general because of, for reasons that we'll, we'll discuss. But you know, they, they were worried about health concerns, they were worried about the, the, the environment, and they were particularly worried that it was going to be sort of a controlling, like this is just about big companies trying to come in and control our, our agriculture. And, um, what was interesting to me in this episode was that scientists around the world um, signed a petition. Like scientists began really speaking out about it, and I think that uh, for a long time the, the debate has been about um, sort of you know just biotech people versus you know activists who are opposing. But I think that. Um, there's, there's sort of like mainstream scientists who might not even be like, they're not genetic engineers necessarily, but they're concerned that there is um, a lack of understanding of the sort of the facts of, you know, are these things, you know, what, what is the real health effect of GMOs? What is the real environmental effect of GMOs? And, and there, so there was this petition that went around trying to sort of saying, you know, golden rice does not raise these concerns and we're, uh, so, I, I, so to me, those two crops were just interesting because they kind of they seem counterintuitive. They seem different than um, the typical GMO thing that you think about when you think about GMOs. So, also, yeah. golden rice is it does two things. It galvanizes the scientific community when they see the kind of destruction of one of the very few field trials that's already passed a lot of hurdles. The Philippines only allowed four, I think, and that's it in the whole world. So if you're looking for long-term environmental impact studies, which everyone always is, they need them, um, what happens if there's already so much protest that uh, activists come in and just destroy it? But also the idea that this is something that actually could benefit the health, public health, it seemed uh, it seemed a very clarifying moment for these worldwide scientists, and I know that Margaret Mellon will have something to say about this. Um, but also at the same time, it's uh, called by, I hope you're all familiar with Vandana Shiva, an India firebrand activist, who will call golden rice the Trojan horse, saying that this is the good seeming thing, and in it comes out a whole raft an army of evil that comes in the guise of this helping to feed the planet forward. So golden rice, which is the longest experimented, um, improved food, genetically modified food, just to improve health uh, of everything. And it's already so slow and so long. And thank you very much. And I'm going to go over to Greg, because you don't have to lead straight with uh, <laughs> golden rice. but. Um, Center for the Science and the, uh, Center for Science and the Public Interest has taken some rather brave stands because I think people, it's the nutritional watchdog in Washington. I hope you're all familiar with it. I won't ask for a show of hands because it should be universal. <laughs> um, you should all be on CSPI site all the time. But they've taken a very uh, moderate, I would say, um, checks and balances, good and bad stance about about GMOs that has upset people on both sides because there's no one down the line way of characterizing it. But could you start with some of the, and they have, what is this called? Straight talk about? Straight talk on, about GMOs. Straight talk about GMOs, which is right there downloadable on the site and is I think a terrific introduction to the damage it can do, the, the environmental and health concerns, and also the benefits. So could you summarize some of the um, 
herbicide and insecticide concerns that everyone has about tolerance, because you, you, you bring out the good and bad in a way most people aren't able to summarize as, as you can. Well, thank you, Corby, and I, I think I will pick up on something that Amy said, where she said not all GE is created equal, and I think that's, that's the way we look at it at CSPI. We look at it case by case, and if there's one message I always tell to students and others, it's always challenge people about the facts and really look at this case by case. It's not a monolithic technology. It's a technology that is applied in specific instances, and when you do, you can have benefits, you can have risks, you can have a whole host of things. And so I think the debate all the time is always characterized as proponents or opponents in some ways exaggerating all of these things, and I think you need to search down below that. And that's what we've tried to do at CSPI, and so we have looked at the current crops in the U.S. and said that those crops are safe, food made from those crops are safe to eat. I think there are a lot of other groups that have said that. Maybe we've said it louder than others. But that was a fact-based look at things. You can't, that doesn't predict what will happen in the future. You still have to look at each one of these on a case-by-case -case basis as they come forward. And similarly, we've looked, as, as Corby said, on some of the, some of the environmental impacts of these crops. And, and there have been some. And, and I, we've been fairly vocal lately about the fact that, you know, while it may be safe to grow, uh, herbicide tolerant soybeans and herbicide tolerant corn, you have to do it in, in a judicious fashion. You have to use it in a way that's integrated with a lot of the other farming techniques that farmers have had for a long time to sort of reduce the likelihood of pests and getting resistant. And we just have a big picture reminder that between 80 and 90 percent of all corn and soy grown commercially in this country is genetically modified. Right, and not only is it genetically modified, but a lot of it's genetically modified to be tolerant to the same herbicide, glyphosate. And so, you know, no surprise that we have now, you know, 22 states with some 15 different weed species that are now farmers are challenged with because glyphosate, using glyphosate with glyphosate tolerant crops was, was easy to use and a lot of farmers adopted it and they made a lot of money off of it, but it may be short-sightedly, they now led to a lot of resistant weeds and that's forcing farmers to now go back to old tools in the toolbox uh, we supported the use of glyphosate, and we still do because it's a relatively benign herbicide. That I'd forgotten, that and it was more benign. That was part of the initial propaganda, I'm sorry, the reports <laughs> about the possible advantages of Roundup Ready, that it already was much less environmentally destructive, and so rolling that back because of tolerance means going to more destructive herbicides. Right, so you have, I mean, I think that properly so, some of the biotech crops have been touted to reduce insecticide use or to lead to... Uh, using more benign herbicides, but that only works if you use them in a judicious fashion, not in a misuse kind of fashion. And, and that's not to say that all farmers are misusing them out there, but unfortunately there has been some misuse of them, and that's led to the fact that now if you ask Midwest corn farmers, they're now spraying insecticides, even though they're also using BT because they want to have an insurance that the corn rootworm doesn't cause that problem. Or farmers are forced on the eastern shore, when I went to visit some farmers a few weeks ago, they said that they are now forced in their herbicide tolerant crops to also pass on their field with another herbicide afterwards to get the weeds that are out there. So um, these are environmental impacts now. They're not different. I mean, we've seen farming has always, over time, had resistant weeds develop and, and resistant pests develop. And so. while you're there, you were so good on defining superweed. We all have heard the term superweed, especially in the context of Roundup Ready. But what you're talking about are just resistant weeds, and you have a different definition of superweed. Right. I mean, I, you know, I've been following the debate for a while, and I may not have it right, but my understanding of a superweed was something where the gene that was introduced into the crop, under the genetic engineering, then passes to either a wild relative or of, of, its, of that, and that becomes a super crop because that now has the gene, so it can't be, it would, it would be resistant to the, the, the herbicide that was sprayed on that. What we're seeing here is just normal biology happening. So there are, there, the weeds that are developing in the field aren't in any way uh, species that are related to corn or related to soybean. It's not the gene is jumping into those species. It's just a natural biological process that, you know, the mutations are occurring naturally or that one of those thousand weeds in that field is resistant to glyphosate and that ends up becoming a competitive advantage um, going back to Darwin. To a, uh, as opposed <laughs> to a frankenweed. That's right which is what they could be called, and insecticides. Uh, could you tell us something about Bt corn and insecticides? So, uh, so again, you have to look at it case by case. Different Bt corn products, have some have reduced insecticide use, some haven't re reduced insecticide use as much as others. If you have Bt cotton, you see a real large insecticide reduction. 
you see some insecticide reduction for Bt corn, depending on whether it's rootworm or corn borer, depending on which pest you're going after. But again, you're also beginning to see in the Midwest some resistant corn rootworms to, some, to one in particular, one of the, the Bt uh, molecules, and again, we won't name companies or anything, um, oh. in part because of the biology around that. The, 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 the Bt toxin that was introduced into the, the, the plant was not a high dose one, and so the scientists had warned us that we might get resistance to it, and we needed to be extra special, careful about it. And again, corn prices went through the roof in the Midwest, and farmers grew corn on corn on corn on corn four or five years in the same field. And any entomologist would tell you, independent of whether it was genetically engineered or not, that if you keep growing corn and using the same insecticides in that field, whether it's a biologically genetically engineered pesticide or otherwise, you're going to put pressure for resistant pests to develop. And so, so monocropping and huge large-scale industrial farming are two of the main themes that go through any discussion of this. We're talking about specifics to do with it, but the practice of monocropping, just one crop as opposed to the traditional rotations and uh, diversity of many crops grown on a plot of land, that has to do with a lot of the problems we see as well. Right, so you have this really, I think, unique tool that is applicable in certain situations and may help farmers with some of the constraints they have, but you have to integrate it within all the other knowledge that we've had in farming. And unfortunately, in some cases, people have forgotten some of that other knowledge. And so if you integrate it in with that, I think it can be very productive and can solve some farmer constraints. This you, you had an interesting point about, for example, when I brought up, what's the point of even defending Bt corn? Because everything is going to develop resistance. So you're going to have to use more insecticide eventually anyway. So isn't it always a case of developing tolerance and then what comes later is worse? And you refuted that. Well, I mean, I think the idea is we want to use all of these tools judiciously and use them when they're needed and use them in a, in a limited fashion, in a judicious fashion, so that you can preserve them for future generations of farmers. And so I think it's not a, a, a one or the other. I think, unfortunately, a lot of the agriculture that we've had uh, in the industrial agricultural complex in the U.S. has been sort of a, a use and abuse and then move on to the next technology situation. Um, and there's always been a next technology down the road. I think if you ask uh, uh, you know, scientists and companies, they don't have a lot of new insecticide down the road. <laughs> and so instead, we're now in a situation where we want to judiciously use these and preserve them. And biotech in some ways may help that and may you know, give a, more, uh, a slightly better environmental profile to agriculture, which has a lot of detrimental impacts on the environment by using them. But you have to then use them in an integrated fashion. Yeah, I think what you said was, so you, it's a way, you have five or six years reprieve of using dangerous insect, insecticides that harm the workers and the fields and the environment, and at least you're getting five years of, of reduced insecticide load. It's better to have that, but it would be better to have 10 or 20 or 25 yeah, years right. For, no, right. for eternity. Yeah. I mean, there are systems out there available to us that would make it possible not to use either the BT crops, which have the pesticide built into them, or pesticides that are exogenously applied. And at least from my point of view, a lot of this debate, which I agree with almost everything that's been said, um, is embedded in a, in a debate <laughs> about the vision of agriculture going forward. And what steps we should take today with the tools that we have in our toolbox to get us to an agriculture, uh, to get us to an agriculture that is not dependent uh, on, on pesticides, on too much nitrogen that takes care of the soil. Now we're obviously, in my view, not going in the right direction right now, um, but that is really uh, one of the important things is to is to make sure that we compare not not biotech to uh, say a BT crop to an exogenous uh, application of a pesticide but to a system where you wouldn't need to use either and that system has been available to all of us uh, for you know ever since I started working on this debate which is you know in the early 80s so I I was there when all the original promises were made but, um, but the, the key to that is to 
is to use the principles of agroecology, which are to rotate the crops, use uh, uh, adequate and well thought out tillage, use cover crops. Now we're not doing any of those things at any level in this country, nor are we working very hard to project that kind of a vision uh, to other parts of the world. And that to me is the big problem with biotech. It's not that it makes uh, food unsafe. I think the products you know, right now on the, on the market are safe, although that says nothing about the citrus uh, uh, greening uh, products, but for, for the time being. But the big problem is that it's taking up too much space in the room, is that this, this uh, panel is talking about biotechnology, which actually is taking us in the wrong direction toward more pesticides, reinforcing industrial agriculture, and not leaving any space to talk about these robust, exciting, viable technologies that are out there that are just being neglected. So I admit, this is like when the cello solo comes in and you feel this warm familiarity. <laughs> and this is the argument that I love to hear. You know, I, I just feel it's like the music coming in. <laughs> However, since we're in Washington and we're trying to be quite realistic and practical throughout this panel, what are government policies that can encourage this and change the framework? Well, let's start with not giving people huge subsidies to grow corn, corn, corn. Let's mm -hmm. try to think about redesigning our agricultural policy. And there isn't a person in this room who couldn't do kind of a better job than the gerrymandered you know, thing we have right now, but that really focused on where you want to go and how you, how you get there. If you want to go to a, to a country where farmers can realistically rotate their crops, you need to think about how to deploy subsidies to make it possible for folks to do that. And maybe you don't give them a subsidy to grow corn five years in a row. You only give it to them one every, you know, one every three. Uh, but there are lots of ways of doing it. The, the problem isn't the mechanics, it's the vision. It's that we're still too willing to accept what we've got is the best we can do. It's but do you see, both. can I just ask, do you see Please. that as a biotechnology issue? Because corn subsidies existed before GM corn. Or, I mean, it's well, so, it does, I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm with you on corn subsidies, but I'm just curious whether it's a, for this, for our GMO panel, like whether it's a GMO yeah. issue or an industrial agriculture issue. It's both, um, and it's not, it's both. We would have a problem with industrial ag without GMOs, but when you've got GMOs, embedded into, and I mean, wrap their arms around the very heart of our industrial system to think that you can talk about agriculture. Did you say tentacles? That's what you meant. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, what we, to think you can talk about one without the other. There's no way you can say, oh, well, we're just gonna talk about biotech over there, and then we're gonna take on all these other products over here. These are integrated into our system. They're, the farmers, you know, I, the idea that, that farmers, what choices, you know, I, I think we need to think about what choices farmers have. I'm not sure that, you know, that they can responsibly, that it's a matter of individual farmers responsibly using Roundup Ready soybeans. I mean, when they're out there, they're being sold to everybody, pushed by every uh, major, uh, uh, all the companies, all the, all the land grants. Um, that's all the kind of advice that you get. All the subsidies encourage you to do it. Uh, to say that, a, that it, to put their onus on individual farmers to be responsible in the use of the technology, I don't think is right. I think we need, you know, we have policymakers who, who do set the stage for agriculture and have set the stage for the agriculture we have right now. I'd rather rearrange that stage. Um, then blame the farmers. Yes, I have to say it's the same thing with the consumer and food safety and meat. Well, if you'd only cook it till it was overdone, and if you'd only bleach your cutting boards, there'd be no problem. So okay. it's up to the consumer, it's up to the farmer. So to feed the planet, um, and I definitely want to see smallholders and small scale rotational farming. And let's not talk about feeding the everywhere. planet. Let's talking about <clears throat> helping the planet feed itself. Great, so we, we will feed the okay. planet, we will feed people, and we will feed the earth. Um, 
So, we do have Phil Miller, who's been so patiently waiting to be attacked here while he's been <laughs> attacked by proxy. Um, so, what are some of the ways that you see a huge commercial, industrial, uh, powerful marketing giant as helping feed small, poor farmers in the developing world? Well, before, before I answer that, I'd, I'd like to state, you know, I, I'm happy to be here. I, uh, I, I and think we're it's all just, happy you showed it's up. just, it's just, uh, yeah. s sincerely, it, it, you know, I, th I think we've got a uh, challenge ahead of us that you've uh, seen all morning long, and, and I think it's inspiring to see the students here uh, committed to this discussion and actually uh, willing to sign up to, to help. And uh, a little bit of career advice, uh, stay in this field, help us figure this out. Uh, I can't imagine a career that could be more rewarding, and it's how I view the job that I do today, of being able to step back at the end of the career and somebody say, what did you do with your life? And to say, I spent time trying to figure out how to feed the world. And I played a role in that, and I contributed. So, so I applaud the fact that you're here, mm -hmm. and that we're, uh, and then the organizers that we can have this conversation. So, you know, he here's the way I, I see the world. You saw it this morning. Uh, we've been able to create sufficiency for many, many parts of our population, but not all. Uh, it's going to get hotter it's gonna get drier and agricultural systems are, are going to shift. And I think what we have to be prepared to do is to look at it in a very science-based, pragmatic, and open dialogue as we go forward to uh, say, what are the innovations we need? What are the technologies that we need? Whether it be breeding, GMOs or biotech like we're discussing here, and something else I'll throw out, if you're in the information technology world, how we use information is going to transform and be necessary to continue to transform agriculture. I've spent a lot of time having these conversations around GMOs, uh, but I spend a lot of time with growers every day. And so I, I do think that this is a uh, place that we need to have these conversations, and I appreciate the opportunity. So, you know, I, um, I think the solutions, to your point, aren't always going to come from the private sector. I think I'm very proud to work for Monsanto, where uh, we've been given the opportunity to create incremental values for growers, and the fact that growers see value in that, they adopt it. And then that allows us an opportunity as well to uh, either donate or bring to farmers, whether they're large industrial farmers or small-scale farmers, some of these technologies that have the ability to improve their lives regardless of where they're at. Like what? Like what have you donated? What kinds of seeds? And then, of course, the big question, uh, when do licensing fees kick in after the initial donations? Yeah, so uh, good question. I get that a lot. Um, <clears throat> you know, Here's a great example of some of the things that we did. We, we've been working on a technology uh, well over 15 years to deal with the fact that the planet's going to be drier, water's going to become limited, and uh, it's called the drought guard technology. As we were developing this, uh, we created a partnership uh, with the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation in Sub-Sahara Africa to not only donate that technology for development in Africa, but also to help them develop and use some of the modern breeding tools to develop new corn hybrids that would increase productivity. So if you've ever had the opportunity to visit some of these farms, what you'd see is they lose a lot of their crop to pests, drought, and they're actually using uh, corn hybrids or, or plants that actually we were using in the U.S. at the turn of the century. All we're doing is stepping them up and giving the advantage that we have in the other developed parts of the world. Which century? Uh, 113 years ago? Early 1900s, mm -hmm. before hybrids were, were produced. So, you know, I think, um, so, so what I see is if those farmers can actually use that technology, become self-sufficient, expand their operations, I do think that there will be a time where 
I would love to see them to get to the point where they are a farmer, much like the U.S., that has the ability to purchase tools and technologies. But will it also be the necessity to purchase tools and technologies? Once they get accustomed to, for example, a drought-resistant corn that is making their lives easier and increasing their crop yields, is this all when the Gates Foundation funding runs out and you've already done this, they have to start paying? You know, let me, um, I think India is a great example uh, from my experience. Uh, and I think it was mentioned by several of the panel members of how uh, BT cotton transformed cotton production in India. Those farmers were living uh, with low quality seeds they sprayed pesticide numerous times, uh, not often with uh, the best protective equipment they often on. on themselves. And then uh, with the adoption of BT technology, essentially what it did was gave them better insect protection that allowed the yield of cotton to go up. If you go in and you look into India and many of those communities, what's happened, and these are small shareholder farmers, what has happened has been because their cotton crop became two things, more predictable, and the yield was significantly increased. They not only had more end product to sell and distribute, the fact that they were able to do that allowed them to send their children to school and educate versus being on the farm, you know, managing, just trying to get that cotton I'll crop just to I'll just interrupt because it happens this morning. Do you all go on to grist.org, which is one of the many websites, this is sustainability, and Nathaniel Johnson is their blogger, and he was juxtaposing the adoption of BT cotton in India with the rate of farmer suicides, because as you probably all know, farmer suicides are a terrible and tragic problem in India, and they have been for a long time. And they, they stayed a absolutely stable as BT cotton went way up. So this, uh, the, the two, it's nice to draw a correlation, but in fact it doesn't work in this particular case. Debt, for many reasons, including I think having to buy expensive seeds is a terrible problem for India, but it wasn't this. But what about food crops and in India? And I'm going to ask Amy, do you remember when you were doing the reporting for Golden Rice, one of the reasons that scientists feel good about signing on in the, in the hundreds to the petition saying, let this research go on, is that there was a promise that the technology was going to be transferred free of charge and it wasn't going to be patented. But how, how is that going to work out in practice? You know, are they actually going to be able to get free seeds, or how is it going to work? Do you know? I, basically, as I understand it, um, the system is, it's, so to make this golden rice work, um, it, it was developed by a bunch of nonprofit organizations, the Rockefeller Foundation, now the Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, is playing a role, and, um, and the, the umbrella organization is called ERI, the International Rice Research Institute. Um, they did get patent from patent or patents from Syngenta, which is a big biotechnology company, um, and they were donated for the use of, by small poor poor farmers who I think that make under ten thousand dollars a year. Um, so the seeds would be developed by you know by the by the government essentially that that will would you know distribute the seeds as as governments do. Um, and, and they would be no more than regular rice seeds. I don't think they're going to be free, but they'll be the same as regular rice seeds at the price. Um, and, and Syngenta does retain the rights to the patent for, uh, to, to use this in case it's like maybe, maybe beta carotene, you know, turns out to be, you know, a cure for cancer or, you know, an antioxidant or, you know, so, some, there might be some application that would, they would want to market in the developed world. So they retain the rights to the patent for that, but for small, farmers, it's, it's donated. Um, and, you know, I guess there is always a question, well, what if those small farmers suddenly, you know, what if those poor farmers to whom, you know, they have a contract and it's clear that it, they, they get it for free, what if they suddenly start, their, their standard of living rises and they suddenly start making lots of money, or they start, you know, maybe they start exporting their golden rice to um, first world, you know, developed world markets and making lots of money on Which it. Which I think um, is the scenario Phil was implying, that if you increase their prosperity, well, they can jolly well start paying for the seed. I mean, I think, I think that, that does happen. That, that's, that's the scenario that I understand it for golden rice. Um, Corby, yeah. Keep Go in ahead. mind, Corby, in some of these countries, I mean, that, I mean, that is on, 
you can take sides about whether it's good or bad, but I went, I went to Malawi, and in Malawi, there are a lot of corn farmers, and right, they use, uh, op a lot of them use open pollinated varieties, but there is a market, a private market for packs of 80 seeds. So where farmers here pick up 80,000 seeds in a, in a, in a huge uh, uh, bag, farmers there are willing to buy and purchase 80 seed right. packets and of hybrid seed, and that they get enough benefit from that to want to buy it because they get a better yield from it. And, you know, so I, my view of this is, you know, we should not decide here in Washington what technologies or what things are going to help farmers there. What I like to do when I work a lot in developing countries is give them the information and give them a regulatory system. I'm a lawyer, give them so they make in their own decisions for themselves what fits in their system. It's one and of what's the main safe points of this printout that you should really all look at straight talk about. GMOs, or what's the, the title of it? About genetically engineered food. About yeah. genetically engineered food. It's tell everybody as much information as they can get and let countries make their own uh, policies. Uh, was Which I interrupting I, you? No, well, no, I, I agree with that completely. It is not the role of people in Washington to tell people in the Philippines what to eat. But I do think it is, I, I would like to know how many people in this audience have heard of iron dense rice. That was developed uh, in order to deal with uh, iron deficiency, which is an equally big problem in the developing world. Uh, it was very successful. Um, it went, uh, they, they got it into the kind of rice varieties that people plant, which and is was always- was it hybridized or GE slash GMO? It was not GMO. It was conventionally bred. It addressed a similar problem. I could not get anybody in the press interested in it, my friends in the press. Time magazine put, put golden rice on the, on the uh, cover of prematurely, Time Magazine. Prematurely, as Amy pointed out. Way <laughs> prematurely, but it, it does shine a light on how you need to think about some of the promises that are being made. Um, this, this is a lot. Um, not about the developing world and everything to do with the people in this audience. The more people think that it's important to use GE in the rest of the world, perhaps it will color their views as to whether we need to have it here and we should be comfortable to have it here. So, and it has from day one been that, you know, I think that's what Vandana Shiva is trying to say. It's a, it's a poster child for that. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm certainly not opposed to it, but I am mightily upset that many other terrific uh, uh, projects that will have similar large-scale health effects, uh, health benefits, are not getting you know any attention um, at all. And I think that's another big part of this debate is that we are again focusing way too much on the golden rice, which may or may not work. I mean, you have to have, you have to be relatively healthy for it to, uh, for it to work. Um, but, you know, not looking at the alternatives, all the other things that you could make it possible for people to have, um, just don't get any attention. Can I add, I, I do think something that you're hearing here is there, I, I think there is great agreement that we've got to look at all innovations and encourage those innovations to solve the challenges we're having. I, I would say um, I don't believe one size fits all, and I don't think every, I do believe every solution is going to be needed, and I, I think we ought to be broad-minded about how we do that. Uh, you know, coming from Monsanto, I can tell you I do not believe that biotech's going to solve every issue. What I do believe is it is one of the tools uh, that we should allow to occur. It should be considered case by case, very much to, has been spoken to. And, uh, and I do think we have a global system set up that allows us to do that case by case assessment uh, before it's released to the public. So, uh, you know, I, I think an important part of this debate is we need to encourage innovation and we need to have policies that allow those innovations to safely get to growers which is, around the which world. Which is something Greg, Greg thinks our regulatory framework, which we didn't even have a chance to address, <laughs> and here we are in Washington. It's very complicated. Some people defend it. Some people, I think rightly, think it has huge holes and needs to be um, 
coordinated. But what we have come up, we've come up with the idea, consider many alternatives. Uh, don't just focus on uh, food safety and environmental safety across the board. It's case by case. There may be, everything may be safe so far and it might not be tomorrow. Uh, so everything has to be evaluated on a case by case basis. There's no one right answer or right opinion or right farming system, but there is a right way to consider them and it's in a very large context trying to think of all the alternatives. And I say that we all adopt Margaret's advice and go looking for stories we haven't discovered yet, we haven't heard yet, that can help others and help feed the planet and bring us forward. Thank you all for coming and thank you Frank for having us.